And the countdown is seriously on now for Christmas, right? This whole late Thanksgiving thing. And holy cow, here we go. And so what I want to just tell you, I hope for you and pray for you in the next few weeks is that Christmas is full of lots of peace and lots of joy and that we kind of can enjoy it and lean into it without getting caught in the potential chaos of it. And so I hope the next few weeks are fantastic for you and your closest friends and whatever your friend group might be and and your family. I just hope it's a peaceful, blessed-filled time. And I'm really glad that you're here today for the final installment, our final move in this series, Under Pressure, where we together have been just trying to uncover a little bit, how do we find hope inside of our pressure, in our suffering? And again, each week we've been launching from the scriptures, the story of God given to us in the scriptures, what we call the Bible. We've been launching from this passage in Romans chapter 5 in the New Testament of your Bible. I want to invite you to turn there again, and maybe again, you grabbed a Blue Worship Center Bible, and if you don't have a Bible, just take it. Let it be a gift to you today. Let it be our gift to you. Uh, If you're going to scroll on a phone or something like that, that's great, or maybe you brought a Bible from home. However it is you're going to get there, I want to really invite you to turn to this passage. We're going to read it together one more time as we just continue to turn our ear towards Jesus and say, boy, in the very real pressure of life, Jesus, how do we, as people who are following you or maybe many of us exploring following you and who you really are, how do we find some hope in our suffering? When we're wrestling with the question of why aren't you doing something, how do we find hope? Some hope. And so Romans chapter 5 is is where we've been kind of learning together and experiencing the words of God together, just spoken into our life. Let's read these. Romans chapter 5. I want to invite you again, as we did last week, just to, we're going to pause in the middle and read together kind of the anchor verses of this passage for us and what they've been over the last couple of weeks. Paul starts this chapter writing these words Therefore, since we've been justified or made right with God through our faith and reliance in Him, We have peace. We've got really good standing, just oneness with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, of all things being set right one day. Now, verses three and four, let's just read that out loud together. Here we go, let's read this. Not only so, But we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. There's those couple of lines that we've just been kind of standing in the midst of saying, okay, suffering's a real thing, but hope on the other end, how do we get there? What is God building? And we love it because of this in verse five, because hope does not put us to shame. Hope just doesn't let us down because God's love is the motive of that hope and it's been poured out into our hearts through his gift in the person of the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. When we give our lives to Jesus, we receive as a gift the person of the Holy Spirit of God himself and it's in his love that we we begin to find this, this hope. And so as we've been navigating that together, we've just been clearly identifying some realities of these words. And in this first one, in suffering, or really what what means under pressure. And we acknowledged right off the bat in this series that, that we all feel pressure at different times. And for some of you right now, this is a time, this is a period of time or a season of pressure. It might be pressure in a key relationship in your life where there's some uncertainty or there's some misunderstanding or maybe where trust has been broken or maybe vulnerability and openness wasn't wasn't quite handled well. Maybe there's just been some hurt and betrayal. Maybe it's a time of, of financially feeling under pressure. Where the momentum isn't quite as good as it Maybe it's been the last few years. Or maybe the sales aren't coming in like they, like they did last year. Maybe it's a new time and a new job. Maybe within the same company or a new company. And there's just some pressure of 
trying to find that new stride and trying to find the balance and understand how to work for a new boss or be the leader of a new group or a new team. Maybe it's, maybe it's just some pressure physically, maybe physically. It just feels like things are uphill a little bit. You're fighting, you're fighting for your health. You're fighting for wellness. Maybe it's pressure on the school front and trying to get across the finish line of a semester with, with some positive momentum and success and to finish well, and yet you feel the, the semester closing in, and, and maybe you didn't even feel pressure, but then everybody else around you started talking about the pressure of the end of a semester, and now you feel it. Or maybe it's just the, the pressure of being you know, a chunk of a way into a school year and still looking for where do I fit? Where's my place? Where do I belong here? What do I do with this bullying and that meanness? What do I do with what constantly feels like rejection? Under pressure can fit so many descriptions. And yet it's a real thing. We all feel it at times, and many of us feeling it right now, where it just feels a little bit like life is squeezing in. The pressure is a little bigger than it has been. And Paul has the audacity to say, hey, when you encounter suffering, when you encounter this pressure, rejoice. Rejoice. I mean, how could he possibly say that? I mean, what is he, he really getting at? Well, it helps us to understand that when Paul uses this word suffering, which is really the word we would translate in pressure, what he's really getting at is this really life-giving truth that, that in pressure, God is building what the enemy is trying to destroy. That's been the springboard for this whole series, that in pressure, God is building what the enemy is trying to destroy. While the enemy might be trying to destroy your health or that key relationship or your momentum at the end of a semester or your, your confidence or your assurance about who you are, while he might be trying to destroy your peace just in your comfort and his provision and finances, God say, I'm going to build that. I'm going to build something in you right there. Everything the enemy means for evil, I'm going to turn it for good, and it's going to be your good and my glory. I'm going, to, I'm going to use that. And that's why in suffering, we get to rejoice because we say, if nothing else, God's building something in me. God, in his goodness and in his love, he's building something in me, which then opens the door for us to begin to experience this, this spirit and this mindset, really, of of perseverance. And perseverance is really just saying, hey, look, at the end of the day, I'm going to choose and I'm going to value long-term redemption over short-term relief. I'm going to see this all the way through. I'm going to walk with God all the way through because I'm going to trust that he's building something in me. And I'm going to choose that, that long-term, I'm going to choose that long-term redemption over that short-term relief. Which then, which then begins to create character in us. It begins to create this, this reality that God is actually in all of this. He's building something in us and he's building our character so that it's like his character. We, we find ourselves in suffering and realize God's building something though, so I'm gonna persevere and choose the long-term redemption because at the end of the day, part of what God is doing is he's, he's building my character. He's making my character like his character. And so I'm leaning on his promises to really understand his character and his goodness and the desires of his heart for the world and, and for me and just who he really is. And, and when we're in that character, what we again begin to realize is that we're really depending on the goodness of God, not the goodness of our circumstances. We're depending on God and his goodness and the goodness of his motives, the goodness of his desires. We're not so much living our lives depending on circumstances, what they could or could not be or become. Because we realize at the end of the day, the God who's building something in me is actually building his nature in me. He's actually growing me more and more into his likeness, into his heart, into his motive and desire. 
And when we begin to see that, when we begin to see, oh man, it's God doing a good work, and we begin to see ourselves starting to live more and more in line with who he is and how he lives and seeing what he sees and loving how he loves, when, when we begin to see that, it, it begins to stir this, this hope in us. It begins to stir this, this subtleness about what could be even right in the middle of our suffering. It begins to grow this, this hope. So the question would be, I mean, what is, what is hope then? I mean, at the end of the day, if we, if we can define pressure and we can define the suffering and we can, we can define the, 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 the perseverance and the character, I mean, what is this, this hope? Well, here's the beauty of hope. Hope, really, hope is confidence in the end while we're still in the middle. Hope is confidence in the end, while we're still living in the middle of the pressure, hope is the confidence of what's coming after the pressure, even if we can't see it clearly, even if we don't fully understand it. Hope is the confidence of what's coming in the end while we're still living in the middle. And when we have that confidence, it, it just shapes how we view everything. It's sitting in the middle and being assured of the end. Maybe not assured of the exactness of the end, but assured of the goodness of the outcome because we're assured of the goodness of the God who's building something in us, helping us choose long-term redemption while we learn to depend on his goodness. So we're sitting in the middle, confident of the end. It's, it's a little bit um, like this and. In the early 90s, when I was in high school, I kind of gradually became this really big Duke basketball fan, which I know doesn't necessarily go over well with, with everyone, okay? But, but there was this, I would watch Duke games, and I'd watch every game I possibly could, and that's, you know, before everything's online or whatever else. So if they happen to be on ESPN, and we happen to have cable at the time, I would get to watch them. And, and I remember watching one game in the, in the end of season college basketball tournament called March Madison. They're playing Kentucky and it was this riveting game. And I remember being on the floor and then on the couch and standing and then laying and then sitting. And I'm just all over the place because this game is so close and it's so back and forth and I could just feel it. And I, I was sweating and I was ramped up and amped up. I mean, it was just commercials felt like forever. Timeouts felt like forever. I mean, this thing had all of me, man. All I was all in, just like, wow, I'm just wanting so bad for them to pull this thing out, right? For Duke to win this thing in the end. I mean, it just, it was wearing me out. I actually want to just show you the end of this game real quick. Take a look at how this game ended, early 90s. So check out the old school, what feels like old school now, footage of this. Check out the end of this game. Look at this. Quick pass to half court and call a quick timeout so they can get in better shooting range. There's the pass to Leitner. Puts it up. Yes! How great is that? How great. Now, if you're not a Duke fan, if you hate Duke, you don't really care, right? That was, that was so great. I loved it. I, I remember that game ended so late at night, and I remember being on my living room floor just yelling and cheering around just this high school kid. I think it's the great. One of my youth leaders at the time, even though it's really late, he called me on a landline because that's all there was, right? Because he knew I'd still be awake watching, and so we're celebrating. It was this great moment. That game had worn me out, but I was so grateful for the end. Do you know what's also true about that game now? is that if I watch the entire game now, I watch it with a completely different confidence in the middle. I don't really have any concern about the end. I happen to know that in that case, Duke wins. I can watch that and there's no uncertainty. There's a settledness. I can watch the game, even in the middle, while the game is still back and forth with confidence of the end. Same is true of a movie you watch and you love it. And so you watch it again and again and again and again. It's like your favorite movie and you keep watching it and you can even recite half of the lines. You never quite feel as nervous the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth time as you did the first time. Why? Because when you're watching in the middle, you already know the end. That's hope. 
I don't exactly know every single detail of every outcome of the end of my pressure. But hope says my God's got the end. But hope says the God who is building something in me and helping me choose long-term redemption, he's got the end. What, what, hope, what hope allows us to do, if you, if you want a slightly different way to look at the definition of hope, hope, hope is the pressure without the panic. Hope is experiencing pressure without the panic because we're, we're being shaped to understand that God's got the end. He's got the end. He's building something in us and he's gonna see it through to completion. What the enemy means for evil, God is going to use for good. What the enemy is trying to destroy, God is going to build. And so while we're in that and, and, and while, we're, while we're finding hope, hope is, hope is growing as God's character is becoming our character. As we're getting more confident in the end, hope is actually growing in us as God's character is becoming our character. That's why what we talked about last week is so important when we're focusing in on the promises, when we're leaning in on, on God and his promises and his nature and who he is and his, and his qualities. What, that's shaping our character into his character and that's growing hope. Why? Why? Listen. Because the more our character becomes like God and in his image, the more our character is shaped and molded by him, the more we trust in his goodness. Because the more amazed we even get at how we're living, the more amazed we get at is when we see his character actually being expressed in our life. The more amazed we get is when even in our pressure, we see ourselves loving differently and responding differently and believing differently. His character is growing in us and we begin to see him changing things in us, which just continues to grow hope. And then hope's got this positive momentum. Then it's, then it's, got, then it's rolling. It's, it's moving for us. So what started is only suffering and this, oh, man, and it's pressure. And look, the pressure's hard and the pressure's real. There's no minimizing that and there's no denying it. Some of us right now today in this moment are in some of the greatest pressure of our whole lives. But something's being built. And as it's being built, hope is getting a chance to grow. Hope. Hope is having confidence in the end but while we're still living in the middle. And it keeps growing as, as God's character keeps growing in us. And then here's the real gift of it. Is that when we begin to experience this hope, when we get to the end and We've started with this question of God, where, where are you and why aren't you doing something? And now we're to this point of seeing God actually do a good thing in us. Oftentimes before we feel like the circumstances are moving. What begins to happen over time is that hope becomes this treasure chest of stories. Hope just becomes this absolute gift of treasure chest of stories. We experience hope in one thing and it, and it fuels our hope in the next thing. We experience hope in one pressure or at the end of one pressure and it, it fuels our hope and it, it starts us with a little bit of hope in the ground of our soul the next time pressure comes and it just becomes like this treasure chest of stories. And they're not all dramatic, right? Some of them are, some of them are remarkably dr dramatic and, and some are are just some of the, the smallest things that if we're not careful, we kind of miss them. Uh, I just rummaged through our house a, a little bit. I knew where some of these things were because I, I do think about them some. I'm going to tell you just some things that are like this treasure chest of hope for me when I, when I see them. So here's one. This is a, um, a mug that Erica, my wife, painted at a paint-it-yourself pottery place uh, that she worked in for a while. It was called the Glazed Bisque, and she made it. It even says on the bottom, she made it in 2001. Okay, so we're starting to push 19 years old on this mug, but we'll never get rid of it. And it's not so much because the mug is so cool. I mean, it's great. She did a great job, and it's, and it's really cool, but, but there was a time when she worked at that little paint-it-yourself pottery place, and she's still going to school, and we're newly married, and right, she's just, it's kind of this side job, right? And she's working there, and there was one period of time while she worked there where we just began to feel under pressure financially. Things got a little bit tight, 
some, some bills we didn't fully anticipate started coming. There were just some things we weren't exactly sure how it was going to work out. We're newly married and we're finding our way and we're loving Jesus together and following Jesus together and thinking, okay, now what? This is, this is some pressure. Okay. And I remember we just started to pray, God, how are you going to do this? God, how would you provide? God, would you provide? God, would you show us how you provide? Would you miraculously provide? Would you show us what we're supposed to do differently? God, would you show us how to steward the opportunity, right? I've got a job, and we're going to this church, and Eric's going to school, and she's got this job, painting herself pottery place, right? The glaze bisque. And I remember one day, she comes home from just working there, working her handful of hours in an evening or in Saturday afternoon, whenever it was. And I remember her saying, John, I can't believe this. I can't believe this today, but while I was working at this pottery place and just helping people, that's what we do. We're just helping them get things and get their pottery and pick things out and get paints. So I was just helping them. Um, one of them, when they left, they, they gave me a $20 tip. They gave me a $20 tip. And listen, I just want to tell you, like, $20 didn't put a dent in what we were up against. But $20 from a place we never would have expected it in an environment where people didn't give tips like that, it just began the little seed of hope for us. It began this, this little movement of, hey, wait a second, I'm building something in you. I'm building something. Think long. Don't do something desperate and dumb. Think long. Think about the long-term redemption of what I'm building in you. Uh, I'm shaping my character and my expectation. You're trying to lean into the promises about how I provide. I'm showing you I got this. It's $20, and, and it, just, it just became this, this reminder. Even today, when sometimes the dollars are much bigger than 20 and the pressure feels much greater for us personally or sometimes even financial pressure as a church, I think about that $20 tip. And I think, wait a minute. I don't exactly know what the end looks like, but I do know who has the end. I do know. I'm in the middle, but I do know. I've got confidence in the end because I've got confidence in the God who's building something in me or in us or in us. It just started with just a $20 tip. This is, um, this is one of my journals. Again, I'm a, I'm a sporadic journal, not an everyday journaler. I've never been an everyday journaler. I got way over the self-imposed guilt of trying to be an everyday journaler a long time ago. This is a journal uh, where a large portion of it is from the summer of 2015. It's almost emotional just to open it. Um, and I was away for some time that summer. And there were multiple times, but there was one really significant week where I was just by myself. And I was in some dark places in my life where I was just struggling. I was struggling to, to feel like I was getting my head above water on some things and understand. And I really was asking God, where are you? Why aren't you doing something? And one of those was, that was one of the moments in my life where maybe I was struggling most with things like insecurity. I questioned everything, every decision, every move I made, every thought I had, every, everything. And some of it was I was just tired. I was, I was worn down in that season. I'd kind of gotten to the end. I, I, did, I needed a break. And when you get too tired, the wrong things elevate, right? And I just, all through this journal, there are these moments with God where he just reminded me he was with me. He just reminded me he had it. There's, there's one particular moment, and I've literally taped in a prayer that I'd gotten, um, I'd gotten from a, a book that I was reading, just uh, the, trying to hear Jesus through all sorts of things. And I literally, I taped this prayer in here and then this passage below it. And I still remember the first time I prayed that, that prayer it was just like I knew in a moment something in my life had changed. I knew in a moment that this grip, what literally was this grip of intimidation and insecurity, that thing was broken in my life. And remember in week one, one of the things we said that one of the ways that pressure can come is just through spiritual opposition. And that, in that moment, the grip of that, the very root of that, was just broken. And this is just, it's, it's part of a treasure chest of hope for me. There's times I just go back to it. I look through a lot of my journals. I dig this one out first almost every time. 
because it's just part of how God built hope because he showed me he was building his character in me. He showed me what he was building in me. He freed me from things and he reminded me, John, I've always got the end. I've always got the end. There's a couple pictures um, that I've got. Uh, this, is, this is one. Um, it's just a picture of our family with the family um, who is the pastor of the church we spent 10 years at in Virginia. Our pastor is actually not in it. He was taking a picture. Um, but that's his family. Uh, and this is our last Saturday uh, before we moved from Virginia the next day. And we spent some time with them. And, and all of the uncertainty of moving and all of the unknown of what was coming and the pressure of uprooting and moving and going where we didn't know people and engaging in something we'd never done before. This has been this reminder to me that even from miles, people were with us. Even from 752 miles away, people were with us. There was a strength and support. And it was just this, it's been this constant reminder to me that God always has people for us if we're willing to see the people he has for us. And it's, it's just a reminder of hope. And when pressure comes and when things are uncertain or when I'm not sure like how we're going to navigate something or who might be a part of navigating something in my family or as a church or personally, I'm reminded of things like this, of pictures like this. They've just become part of a treasure chest of hope in my life. They remind me, wait a second, John, in the middle, we can be confident of the end. In the middle, we can be confident of the end. This, this other one that I, that I brought and... Um, it's just a picture of me doing a wedding um, several years ago. Again, it's, it's, it's a wedding in Virginia. And, and the reason this one's always stuck out to me is while I was engaging with this couple before they were married and walking towards a marriage and, and getting to know them a little bit, um, he and I especially, this is my friend Dennis, um, we had a lot of conversations about Jesus. Uh, when we met, he wasn't a follower of Jesus. He really wasn't sure what to do with Jesus or what to make of Jesus. And we had a lot of conversations heading towards their wedding and then in this growing friendship of what would it really mean to follow Jesus? Who is he and how does he really view me? And it ended up being through a combination of circumstances and combination of multiple people investing in Dennis and just loving him and walking with him and hearing his questions that actually before their wedding, Dennis, Dennis surrendered his life to Jesus and became a follower, still following Jesus today, him and his, and his wife. And it's just a reminder, it's just a reminder to me that you know what, no matter where we meet people along the way, no matter what the questions are, Jesus is always lovingly in pursuit. And each of us has a part to play to convey his love. He gives us the strength to see what he sees and love how he loves. And it's just a reminder that even heading to significant things like weddings can become about much more than a wedding. It reminds me of hope. It reminds me that while I'm in the middle of conversations and while I'm in the middle of relationships, God's got the end. God's got the end. And that's that's hope. It's this uh, this God-given ability because of a God-given story to be so shaped by his character that we live in pressure, in the middle, but with confidence of the end. That's what Jesus would invite us to. That's what Jesus is saying. Hey, come do that. When Paul's writing that, when Paul's writing this, 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 hey, lean into this, absorb this for all that it's worth. What he's really saying is, look, you can celebrate because you know, because you got confidence in the end. That's hope. That's hope. And so that hope, it allows us to actually rejoice in our suffering. That's what Paul meant when he said, we glory in our sufferings, we rejoice, we celebrate. Hope allows us to rejoice in our sufferings. Hope gives us the unthinkable ability to sit in the middle of significant relationship pressure and rejoice because we know who has the end. Hope allows us to sit in the middle of ongoing emotional healing from wounds and disappointments. Sit in the middle of the pressure of that healing journey with hope because we have confidence 
and who has the end and who is building something in us towards that end. Hope allows us to rejoice in the suffering when we don't feel like we want to feel physically, when it's not moving quite at the pace we want. But Jesus is growing something in us. He's building the faith the enemy is trying to destroy. And he's molding our character into his image and building our anticipation so that even in the middle, we can have hope of who's got the end. You can put any suffering reality in that equation. And what hope is, does is it allows us to be in the pressure but have confidence in the end. It's the ability, and it's that ability to be in pressure but not panic. And listen, that's a, that's a supernatural ability when it comes to most of the pressures that we face in life. And when most of life and most of the people who have our ears are telling us to panic, and telling us that even panic should be the normal thing and our normal response. God's saying, no, 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 no. I want to build something in you. I'm going to build in you the peace the enemy is actually trying to destroy. I say, okay. Then I'm going to choose that long-term redemption and building of my peace. And I'm going to focus on the promises of God about his peace and about his strength and about who he is in peace in me. And that growing, leaning into his promises will grow his character in me and it will give me a confidence of the end while I'm still in the middle. That's just how good God is. Where's your pressure right now? And is it possible that, that God really is building hope in you? You want to know the really good news? That once we, we, we get through some pressure and we've got some hope, it goes all the way back around, and that hope actually becomes the initial strength the next time we face pressure. We never face enough or another pressure completely void of hope. Because we've been through the pressure and we've been through the perseverance and we've been through the character and we have this hope and then we carry that hope around in our lives and everywhere we go, that hope is now a part of us. So when a new pressure comes, we don't start bankrupt on hope. We start with a seed of hope already in us and it just keeps expanding in our life. There's a power to that kind of hope. What's your pressure? If God could give you any encouraging word today, I think his encouraging word would simply be, listen, that pressure is a real thing and my compassion is so present and it is so real for you. And I'm aching with you where you're aching and I'm weeping with you where you're weeping, but I want you to know I do have the end. I'm going to build something in you. I do have the end. Paul, this same guy who wrote this, Romans chapter 5, later in the same letter to the same group of people, he comes back to hope a little bit. And I think it's fascinating that towards the end of the letter, he wants to come back to it. Listen to, to what, what he says. I, I, I love this. Romans 15, 13. It's like he just speaks this prayer over them, this blessing, right? Which I love. Like, we like that here, the blessing. And this is what he says to them. He he says, may the God of hope, the God who is hope, the God who hope originates with, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Hmm. Even right now today in your pressure, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And he goes on to, to say that happens as you trust in him. As we trust in him, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, as you lean on him, as you lean into those promises of who he is and what his heart's desire is for you. May, may he fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. And then I love how this verse ends. Listen to this. Just soak this in. Open up your heart to this so that you may overflow with hope. Man, how good would it be to be overflowing with hope? hope, with a confidence in the end, even while we're in the middle. 
to be under pressure but without panic. So that you may overflow with hope, not by your own power and not by your own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God himself living in you. May you overflow with hope by the power of the Spirit. May you overflow with hope. May you overflow with the confidence of the end while you're still in the middle. May you overflow with hope. May you overflow with peace in the middle of the pressure. May you overflow with confidence in the end while you're still in that relational pressure. May you overflow with confidence of the end while you're still navigating that physical uncertainty. May you overflow with hope while you're still right in the middle of financial pressure and question. May you overflow with confidence in the end while the pressure still feels present and very real. May you overflow with hope all by the power of the Holy Spirit who reminds you that God is building something the enemy is trying to destroy and helps you see long-term and choose the long-term redemption over a short-term relief and reveals promise after promise after promise after promise of the goodness of God for you. May you overflow the confidence of the end while you're still in the middle. How great is that? Pressure is a real thing. But listen to me, listen to me. Pressure is a real thing. We've owned that these last four weeks, right? We got to own it. It's part of life. God's honest about it in the scriptures. Pressure is a real thing. Listen, hope's a bigger thing. Pressure's a real thing. You've got pressure. I've got pressure. I've got pressure that a short-term relief right now would feel so good. It seems like a great option someday. But hope's a better thing. Hope's a bigger thing. Pressure's real. Hope is bigger. May you overflow with hope through the person of the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer for us. That's been my prayer for us in this month as we've navigated this series. It's not that we would weirdly deny pressure or act like it doesn't exist. It's that we would admit pressure is a real thing, but that we would overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we could live confidently and while we're in the middle. And you know, we, we receive the Holy Spirit as a gift. We don't earn the Holy Spirit. We give our lives to Jesus. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that we could live in his strength, so that we could overflow in things like hope. We surrender ourselves to him and say, here's all of me, but he's a gift. So what we're gonna do at the end of this series, that just to finish this, is we're actually gonna celebrate the fact that hope is even available to us. We're gonna celebrate the, the ability, the supernatural ability and the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the middle of pressure, but with confidence in the end. We're going to celebrate that by just sharing in communion together. This reminder that Jesus gave himself for us, this taking of the bread that reminds us his goodness was so great to us, he allowed himself, his flesh to be torn apart, to experience a brutal murder on a cross. He allowed himself to die, to to shed his blood, right? The the life is in the blood, and Jesus was willing to, to shed his so that you and I could have life with him, not just survive, but to have life with him and be people who overflow in hope, even in the midst of our pressure. So we're going to share in communion, and we're just going to celebrate that. We're going to celebrate the goodness of Jesus on our behalf. We're going to celebrate the gift that hope is. And we're just going to remind ourselves, or we're going to allow the Spirit to convince us today that he is the giver of hope. He is the giver of confidence in the end while we're in the middle. He is the one that is building something in us that the enemy is trying to destroy. We're going to take it with really, really grateful hearts. And I pray and I hope that you'll allow him to encourage your heart. And maybe he'll encourage your heart first by by literally weeping with you, aching with you, identifying with you in your suffering and in your pressure. 
maybe in the very same moment, he'll instill some hope. He'll burst some hope because of his goodness and the assurance of his presence and the promise of his presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to share in this great time of celebration together. I'm going to hand it back to you at your location. Let's celebrate big as we share in communion together today, remembering the God of hope that can overflow in our lives to the person of the Holy Spirit.